Professor to introduce Professor Harper Frenchstrom, a distinguished professor at Chalmers University, Sweden. He's also with the Zero Point Technology, which I think he founded. Um, uh, he is a well-known computer architect person and has worked in areas of chat memory system, memory coherence, memory consistency, and related areas. He has, uh, I think, uh, four textbooks in this area and uh, a couple of hundred uh, research papers. Uh, he's a fellow of uh, ACM, fellow of IEEE, and a fellow of the Royal Swedish uh, Academy, uh, Royal, sorry, Royal Spanish Academy. Today, he will talk about enabling efficient memory systems with novel compression methods. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Gobi. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, first time I'm in Bengaluru, and uh, it's going to be a fun week. And I'm going to give a keynote at the uh, uh, IPC conference next week also. So. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is actually one of the research themes that I've spent a lot of time on, and that's uh, actually to use um, compression techniques to make uh, memory systems more efficient. And um, the reason actually, when, when this started, uh, uh, my interest in this started, actually, I have to thank my daughter for that, because when she was a small little girl, uh, dad used to uh, read fairy tales when it was bedtime, and then I had to wait for her to get to sleep, and I'm a very restless person, you know, I, I, I want to use every second of my life to, to think about the exciting problems in computer architecture and maybe other problems. And so when I was waiting for her to see, I thought to ask myself, wow, if we could compress data efficiently, thank you very much, um, in, in memory, then there are a lot of, you know, potential benefits. We could expand memory capacity, we could bring data closer to the, on the chip, you know, in a more efficient way, etc., etc. So when she slept, I went up and looked, you know, what has been done in, in this. And this was back in, you know, pretty much the beginning of this uh, uh, millennium. And uh, that was really not that much. I have looked at it at the IBM. But um, I have to say that the te techno techniques that were uh, developed there was not very efficient. So I started with a number of PhD students. To do that, so I, I like to do some kind of points, go, go to some of the interesting things we have done. So I'm going to talk about uh, one topic is uh, um, uh, first I'm going to give a motivation for why uh, a little bit older than I did, and then we're going to look into what we came up with a few years ago, statistical cache compression, and some recent. Uh, uh, progress on compression algorithms called GBDI that we published uh, this year in HPCA before I conclude. Okay, so uh, to elaborate a little bit more on the benefits for using cache compression, so here we have a typical you know, multi-core system, as you can see. And if we compress data in the memory and in the caches, what then uh, we could achieve is that we improve the utilization of both caches and memory because we can store simply more data in them, right? But it doesn't stop there. We can also improve the utilization of inner connections, especially the, the channel between the chip and the memory, because if we have the data compressed in memory, we can bring it on the chip more uh, efficiently, right? And that does not only provide higher performance, it can also uh, reduce the activity, right? So we could uh, uh, reduce the power consumption. And this is, of course, big deal for, um, I would say, any computer system, but especially data centers where performance per what is uh, super efficient. I'm going to get back to that later on in my talk. Okay, so. Um, um, we are all familiar with uh, the notion of reference locality. It comes in. Like when you talk about the power uh, uh, reduction, right? We're also taking into account the 
has to compress and decompress, or the power to compress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, so does it depend on which compression scheme you use, or is that important? Independent of the compression scheme, you could always say that there is an improvement in energy. Yeah, what we have seen is actually that, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, the fact that we need to compress and decompress will consume energy, but uh, cancelling a memory request will save a lot of energy, right? So it's much more than, than what you need to add. Um, but that, that's an important point. So I can elaborate a little bit on, more on that a little bit later. So we all know about the notion of reference locality encompassing two flavors, spatial and uh, temporal reference locality. Uh, as we all know, means basically temporal locality that uh, there's high likelihood to access the same location and spatial locality that it's high likelihood to, to um, access a nearby location. Access in memory. Let's see if I can get yeah. here. So, for example, temporal value locality would, would be that we access that, that uh, same value, whereas uh, spatial value locality means that we access nearby values. Now, I'm going to get back to these, or we can exploit this uh, uh, this uh, property when it comes to compression algorithms suitable for memory systems. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, this, uh, this is uh, an interesting observation we did uh, quite many years ago. So, I, I um, want to get back. Okay, to so the, the uh, red curl here corresponds to this value where cache, and as you can see, it drops uh, faster because you can basically uh, store more data in that uh, cache. And for example, if we would pick a conventional cache of 2 megabytes, then we would get the same level of MTKI, misses per kilo instruction, or um, a value where cache that is only 128 kbytes. So that's a, a compression factor of 16 times. So that motivated me and my PhD student a lot to go after how we could implement such a cache. Um, something we thought about earlier was, in fact, you know, so uh, kind of an obvious idea when you start thinking, how would you do this? That would be to basically, um, uh, of course, only store each value once, and then, but then you need a, a metadata point or two where that is, right? And that kills basically all the compression potentials there is. Um, so we didn't pursue that, we gave up on that one. In fact, so here are some numbers from some more uh, SPEC 2006 applications, and we can see that uh, all across the board we get a lot of compression going this way. Um, so we instead went for something that uh, would be, um, the concept would be called statistical cache compression. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. That's a paper we published in ESCA in 2014. So, uh, applying compression to the uh, last level cache is uh, quite attractive. And the reason for that is that you probably know that uh, um, uh, pretty much 50% of, 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 the, of the microprocessor chip is used for caches, and you always ask for more. There is this uh, rule of thumb that if you um, increase the capacity by a factor of by a factor of two, then you would reduce the miss rate by the square root of two. It's fairly, you know, a good estimate of how much it means to increase the capacity. So we always want to make the last ever cache larger. And, but the downside of using compression is, of course, if we only compress here, we could think of compressing everywhere, right? But I'm going to stick to the fact that we only compress the data here. Then we need, when we bring the data from the memory inside the cache, we need to compress it. And then when we uh, experience a miss in the L1, L2 cache, then we would have to decompress the data. And there is, of course, the latency that we get. Yeah. Okay. Thanks,
compression ratio is Yes. So I look at this data, it seems like there's a sweet spot for cash sizes where the compression makes the most effective. Is most effective. For example, if I choose a much larger cache, the gap between the conventional and the compressor. Right, like is, like here. Right. So I would have thought that you would use this data to motivate an L1 cache compression as opposed to large L3 cache. There's something changed in this data from the time this was generated to the 2014. Is we're applying the speed of the caches. Um, that's a that's a good observation. Um, uh, well, no, I, I would say so. I mean, in fact, I mean, in this effect, we use pretty much the same applications. It's not that we change. We use still use spec 2006, and we're going to see that. I mean, we get a, a lot of. Uh, uh, improvement with uh, for uh, but you are absolutely right. Uh, may maybe there is certainly a case for the L1 L2 cache. The problem is that I mean, when you access the data, let's say in the L1 cache and see if it's compressed, then you will have to decompress it, right, with the data involved with that. Something that is um, uh, could be interesting to look at is actually to um, I think you have done something like that in the past with uh, compressing data in the register file, right? And actually um, making the decompression um, part of the pipeline, right? That would certainly work fine for, for streaming applications like in GPUs, right? But I, I think there is something uh, to, to would be interesting to do that also for CPUs, right? So that would actually be, be that would be possible to do, then you could think of actually having data compressed everywhere and then adding your stuff in, in the register file as well. And then you only kind of decompress it when, when you do an arithmetic. Anyway, now I went very fast, right? Now I'm going to go back to this L3 cache. Uh, here it is. Yeah, so, so we, we picked the L3 cache more from a pragmatic reason that we have to decompress it. And um, uh, you will do some cycles there, but I mean, accessing the L3 cache will take quite a few cycles, so maybe maybe it's affordable to do the decompression. That, that's why we did it. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that how, uh, you know, how you, if you increase the cache size, the uh, how the miss rate will come down, but you know, this is probably true for spec, but if you go for more, like say, applications like Cloud Suite, they would suggest at least um, this also uh, happens in say uh, more cloud-facing SOC designs like Graviton two, three, that you know having large L three cache can be detrimental because anyway you are not going to hit there. You will, you know, because the working set is so large, and what you would end up doing is by just accessing the large cache, you will lose uh, performance. So what I'm trying to understand is that um, this this notion that larger cache will always help. Yes, that's true for spec. Is it extendable to more cloud facing workloads? No, you're right. I mean, we can come up with many examples of applications that don't benefit from from a larger L3 cache. You, you're, you're right. I mean, um, uh, it's certainly beneficial, and I'm going to show da data for that for spec applications. But there are certainly applications where it would not make sense. In fact, so that, then maybe I mean uh, you should you should buy if the L3 cache doesn't help you, then maybe you should bypass it, right? And you should not uh, uh, compress data for 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 that. That's something that uh, yep. we have looked into but uh, yeah that 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 uh, that is absolutely true yes um yeah so the the benefit it, it would be improved latency and bandwidth uh, if we compress it and the reason for that is that if with the larger cash the hope is that we will bring down the number of misses so we don't have to go to the slow memory right and also um 
misses with consume the memory bandwidth and power consumption too. So that's also a benefit. In fact, I, we did some in the company setting because this is technology that has moved to to a storage company. We did actually some estimation of the improvement in performance per pass, but performance for what with uh, uh, cache compression technology, and it's like uh, again for spec applications, it's uh, like thirty percent or so in improvement. So it's quite a big deal. Okay, so so how do we get the, the compression to work in, in the last level cache with this what we call SE two uh, statistical cache compression? So uh, at the point state of the art was that uh, I mean there were some compression algorithms out there. BDI, which is actually a simple scheme, but quite effective. And that is, I can simply explain it as follows, that what you do is that you look at in a cache, in a, in a memory block, you take the first non-zero value and use that as a base. And then you basically encode the other values as the difference, the delta to that base, right? So if the values inside a block are numerically similar, then you will get a lot of compression going. That's essentially what it is, right? And the zeros you can also you can use the zero also as a base, and that means that all small integers will be compressed very effectively. FPC is uh, also very simple scheme. So the good thing about BDI is that you compress and decompress in a few cycles, right? Uh, FPC and CPAC uses kind of you know common patterns. It could be um, runs of zeros, it could be um, uh, small integers, etc. But the thing with these schemes is that while they are, you know, um, have a fairly short uh, uh, decompression latency, they are not very effective. So what we, our motivation was in, instead to afford a little bit longer decompression latency, not like 100 cycles, of course, but more in the range of 10 cycles, and then hopefully get some more compression going, and that's uh, what we managed to do, right? And uh, we went for Huffman compression, um, and Huffman compression, as you know, encodes uh, frequent values with fewer bits than not so frequent values. That's essentially what happens, right? And um, so, in order to do that, you need to know the um, value frequency. Uh, so that's one thing you need to uh, uh, do acquisition of value statistics, and then code generation, and then uh, I'm going to talk about the cache architecture, how you must change the convention of cache, right? So value statistics acquisition. The way we propose to do that is by a, a small a support mechanism in the cache, what we call the value frequency table up there in the right hand corner. And what that does is to basically, if you take a snapshot of the cache, this should re reflect the, the, the um, value frequency of different values in the cache. And in order to do that, so what, what this essentially, how this is implemented is essentially like a cache, but instead of keeping the data, we just, um, we just uh, for each that data value, keep a counter where we basically implement the counter where we see that same value again. So when we bring a block from memory inside the L3 cache, then we have to look at all the values and increment the corresponding, do, do a lookup in this value frequency table using the value as an index and then basically uh, increment the counter. Likewise, if you um, uh, evict the block from the cache, then all those values will go away. So you have to also do a lookup in the value frequency table and decrement um, uh, the corresponding counters. You also need to do that if you modify a block in, in the cache. You need to do a similar type of operation. So once, uh, so so when you have warmed up that structure, then you can decide to do Huffman encoding, and that we delegate it to software. And I'm going to show you why that makes sense, because it would be a rare event to actually create this encoder. We're going to see that later. Um, okay, so let's see 
what uh, compression results we ended up with in comparison with state of the art at that time. Uh, so we have the SC2, the compression ratio on the y axis uh, as a function of all these uh, spectral functions. How do you think the balance how many distinct values do you try to store? Right, so it's um, on the order of, uh, so you don't have to, so, so the thing is with Hartmann encoding, there is something you don't need to have all the values because we can go up to a certain length of the code, right? So if I uh, remember correctly from the top of my head, we're talking about the structure which is 10k or something like that. Yeah, so it's, it's not, it's a uh, quite, quite a reasonable structure for that. Um, so we have the compression ratio here as a function of all these uh, apps, and uh, as we can see, the, so the red bar here is this statistical cache compression, and the green and the blue are uh, these are other schemes, more simple schemes, right? And as you can see, uh, all across the board, uh, the SC2 does better. In some cases, actually, there are some exceptions for v 2 and H264, then actually DDI does better. Yeah, right. Um, um, so um, geometric mean here, uh, we, we get round two in compression rate for these applications. That's a little bit better for integer applications than turning points. Um, so um, yeah, I said that we could delegate the code generation to software, and why is that? Well, if we so so one question is of course. How, when we run these programs, how will compressibility change? And so, what we did an experiment with actually warming up the cache, create the encodings, and then we let the program run with, with that uh, uh, encoding and look, look at different points what the compression rate is. Oops, no, I went too fast. Sorry about that. Um, So if we take just one example here, this is the uh, Cactus ADM, then what you can see is um, that, so here is, uh, of course, uh, I mean the initial compression ratio, then it draw, drops to from 2.6 or so to 2.1 or something like that, but then it stays quite constant. And this was not only for that one, but also for the others here, it, it stayed quite uh, constant. In fact, there is an anomaly for uh, GC where you can see that it actually uh, goes up, and that's uh, a famous uh, um, property of, um, uh, of the GCC that you, um, you, enter, you have two distinct phases, right? And for some reason, it, uh, this uh, second phase benefited from, from the compression uh, encodings, that, the encodings that were connected earlier. One thing it shows you that once you do a compression once, or once you do the coding once, uh, you seem to be getting constant amount of benefit for the rest of the program. That's what it just happens. Like yeah, you don't and, need to do and, coding you know, again and again. That's right, that's right. And that's, uh, otherwise, I mean, it would be uh, not so good to use half money. I mean, if you had to, you know, create new right. code. But, but that's it. Also show that if I do a different encoding, I might get a much better compression. It doesn't show that either. Right? No, the point with GCC, in fact, uh, I mean, it's just the more general behavior here is that uh, maybe that uh, I mean you might drop a little bit, but you you get quite much. You, you get whatever you are getting before, but it doesn't say that if you change, you could have gotten ten times more compression. That it doesn't say, right? It doesn't say that. That's an interesting one, yeah. in fact. Yeah, I mean, it it yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's that's true. Yeah. So, so again, one related question is that is that how would that initial phase of the program kind of determine the complex uh, the, the coding aspect of the entire execution of the program? Right? Because there's obviously an initial phase of the program, correct? So what is the intuitive explanation that it remains the same? I think one of the reasons is that, I mean, you tend to, most of the data is read only, and it's just a small fraction that, I mean, the, the reason why it should change is that you would, you would um, modify your data structures a lot. Right. 
And I think that, that uh, that's actually, we haven't looked at this, it's more like a conjecture. But uh, I, I um, speculate that it depends on the fact that um, uh, it's just a small, fairly small fraction of the whole data structure that is modified. And so, for the read only um, part of the data structure, that will not change, right? So, that would be the intuition here. Good. So, um, right, so uh, the next topic here is how would we need to change the, the convention of cache with, uh, uh, to enable cache compression. Well, you obviously need these compression decompression accelerators, and you need to um, design them so that they are fast, as fast as they can, given the compression algorithm. So we actually spent a lot of time in looking especially at the decompression accelerator because that's on the critical path. I mean, when you compress, that's when you basically leak blocks from, from the cache to the memory. They are not, not so critical to performance. It's the, Decompression accelerator that is fast. And the problem with Hartman is that it's, it, it seems like it's very sequential, right? You need to figure out how big is this code and decompress that before you can decompress the next value. So there is some in, inherent ser serial uh, processing going on there. But you can actually, at the hardware level, do that with, um, with uh, some. Um, uh, tweaks to, to do it quite fast. So we managed to, uh, so we went all the way down to RTL and um, um, looked at um, the implementation of the decompression engines and ended up with that it takes uh, seven clock cycles. And my PhD student at the time could actually bring it up to uh, 3 gigahertz. So we were very happy with that. Um, but that's not the only thing that is needed. So if you can compress, let's say, by a factor of four, then you could put four memory blocks into one cache line frame. And now as you essentially need four tags, four times as many tags, right? And so the tag store will uh, uh, increase in size. Now, luckily, the tag store is a sm very small fraction of, of the entire L3 cache. So even if you, I think we did experiment with uh, four times as many tags, and the overhead is not too bad, right? Um, and given the potential that you could increase the size by a factor of four, it's certainly something you're willing to pay. But you also need, for each tag, you need some metadata which I have illustrated up here. Um, so you need to, 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 to basically uh, point to where uh, each of these, let's say we have two blocks we can stick into cache line frame, then we need in the tag store uh, a point to, to exactly where these blocks are located in the, in, in the um, and then there is also free space management to, to compact data so that you can stick as much mem many memory blocks into it. So there's a lot of opportunities for optimization, right? Uh, there are funny things that you can work on to You can start with some simple uh, LRU-based replacement policy, but remember that works fine if all the blocks are, are of the same size because then when you evict, um, then when you need to bring one block in, you just pick the least recently used block and kick, kick that out. But that is not as if I've not continued before. I, I take a question from more of it. So, um, but this particular approach, when you have the data that's sort of compressing for four blocks in the cache line, or 10 blocks, and do you rely on a fixed size compression always and basically have 64 byte block compressed to 16 bytes and no 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 i mean i was just taking an example so i mean you could compress to uh, you could compress to any any degree here yeah, yeah but, but, but I'm, what i'm saying is that you can't have variable sized compression if you want to put fixed 
number of blocks. Like for example, one 64 byte block cannot be compressed to 17, another 64 byte block compressed to 12 bytes because you can't align them properly in the data stream. Right, right. right. So, so how do you guarantee that your compression always stays within that fixed size? I, I can easily understand if you add if you are less than 16 bytes, but if it's more than 16 bytes, yeah, so so in this work, what we did was actually that we didn't uh, make any restriction on the compression size. So so basically, the idea is to um, um, occasion do compaction so that you move all the blocks so you get as much free space as possible, and. If, you're, if you can use that space, that's a different story. I mean, if you're going to bring a block that fits, then you're fine. But if it's bigger, then you can, of course, not. Then you have to replace uh, a block to make space for that, right? Oh. But that's what we ex experimented with here. There is another option, and that is that you say you either compress by, you know, a factor two to the power of some, something, right? Then you will lose some compressibility, but it will be much simpler to manage. So that you can also do, and in fact, we have seen that, I mean, you lose some compressibility, but it's not too bad, right? And it becomes, makes life much easier. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the point. If you can fixed action like that, you can implement it more efficiently. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. So, one more question. Yeah? So when you talked about compressibility, Coding. You are looking at it at what granularity, what granularity uh, in the Hoffman coding or? Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, so we compress every single, in fact, um, in, in that uh, graph, we assume that we compress every, every 32 bit value, right? So, so it's at the, at the granularity of values, right? Yeah. Is that the sweet spot or is it, uh, Part and we looked at uh, basically, I think even 64 would make sense to do. Now we fix it to 32 here. But we looked at 16 bits also, that's not as, I mean, there's a sweet spot with 32 and 64. <clears throat> right. So, so um, yeah, with compression aware replacement algorithm. So, um, imagine that we bring. Um, a block into the cache that is larger than the one, the LRU block, for example, then it would be not be enough to just evict the LRU block. We would have to make space for more. Uh, so the question is, which which one should we pick? If we pick the neighbor one, maybe that's an MRU block, right? So that would not be good. In fact, this uh, we, we ne never thought it or looked into this. I think it's an interesting, I think it's still an open problem. To look at um, 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 replacement algorithms that take size into account, right? That's been some work, in fact, by Michel Dubois, uh, sadly passed away uh, earlier this year. He did some work on cost sensitive replacement algorithms that I found very interesting, and it goes, it goes along that uh, one could use that framework then for it. Anyway, um, so. What do we have here? Yeah, so that's the last uh, um, slide on on the, on the cache compression. Um, so um, so what we have here is essentially uh, on the y-axis the improvement, the weighted speed up, right? So how much more performance do we gather? Um, and it's been some misalignment with some of the bars here, I see. But anyway. And so we 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 formed uh, work level mixes because we were running on a multi-core with um, one group called NGM, which is um, um, uh, negative um, impact, just that we would not expect to see an improvement of the IPC simply because you know that their working set would fit in the last level cache without compression. Oops, no, I did something bad. That's okay. um, and then uh, on the other side, the positive uh, impact would be those that uh, where you where you uh, actually see a lot of misses, right? You would benefit from a lot of cash. Um, and 
and some meter drum, sorry. Uh, and then uh, there are a lot of bars here. Um, LSC times two and LSC times four corresponds to twice as. So we start with a certain um, size of the last level cache. If I remember correctly, we assume one megabyte per, per core. Um, and then we consider twice as big cache and four times as big cache. And then the baseline cache with FPC and BDI and SC2 with four times tag, four uh, times as many tags. Okay, so what do we get here? The first interesting place, first interesting data we looked at was actually how, if we cannot take advantage of the compression but just get the bad aspects of compression, that is the decompression latency when we read from the cache, how much worse performance will we get than the uh, baseline cache, which is one here. And that's actually the one here. So we would lose, remember that it's 0.9 here and one here. So it's like 2% performance degradation. And that is an assumption that you would not take advantage of the compression at all, just get a bad thing that is the decompression rate. That was pretty good. Now, um, um, the best case would be, uh, correspond to the fact that we actually um, do decompression in zero time, but we take advantage of the, of the, of the, the compression uh, effects in, lar in larger uh, entry capacity, and then we will get like 30 percent improvement in performance. And then, of course, it's depending on the workload mixes, it will be somewhere in between, you could say. So that's and, and something that is pretty interesting to see is actually that we do better than the four times bigger cache. And one would think that that is strange, but the fact is that what we did was to really do cacti simulation on the four times bigger caches, and that would be much slower, right? So um, uh, then, do using the baseline cache with compression enabled, so we gain performance by actually building using a cache that is much faster, uh, which is very good news. Right. Having said that, uh, I have to do some, you know, uh, say something about a company. We started, I started this with this PhD student called Angelos Aralakis, uh, and uh, we early on saw a lot of commercial, commercial value in compression, and um, so we started to patent everything before we published it. We patented it uh, quite ambitiously uh, in case we were going to start a company. When he graduated in 2015, we um, started this company, Zero Point Technologies. In fact, we changed the type of uh, uh, logo uh, quite recently from this one to this one. This is a set, if you wonder why it looks like that. And uh, this company's uh, uh, mission is to deploy memory compression technology. And the way we started, we could have started with, you know, uh, offering compressed caches, but we said to ourselves, how are we going to, you know, convince Intel, throw out your cache out of the window that they have, ex you know, put so a lot of effort on. And uh, no, that's not going to fly, right? So we said, why don't we go for memory compression? And the reason for that is that the interception of memory compression would be like we put an IP block close to the memory controller that does all this magic with compress, compressing data in the memory. That was a much better, you know, integration point to talk to all the instances in the world, AMD, etc. right? Um, so that's what we decided to do. And I don't regret that we did that, actually, because that turned out to be a good thing. Um, so I'm not going to say much. Well, I'm going to say a few bits because that's going to link into the, the other paper before I start. And so here is actually how we integrate our technology in a system on a chip, which we call Septillion here. It's a, it's an IP block that actually uh, offer the benefits of you know larger memory capacity or improved memory bandwidth, and these are things that um, industry is interested in now. 
um, you could actually claim that with CXL, we we don't have anything to offer, but you can add this on top of CXL too, and we have found a lot of interest in, in, in this in, with CXL to actually offer higher memory capacity when it comes to the tier two memory, right? Even the fast memory, of course, that one is here, and then you could have <coughs> this PCI Express kind of you know interface to add on to that. Okay, so um, so this is uh, capable of improving memory bandwidth by 30%, leading to 20% uh, higher performance for one. The, very importantly, with with this IP block is that we we would be able to do that with a small chip footprint. I mean, if we were saying that this takes the same size as a core, right? Then you know the door is there. We are not interested in your product. Uh, so, in fact, the size of this IP block with 7 nanometer of technology is like one square millimeter, so it's kind of small. The idea here is to keep the memory compressed or keep the memory as uncompressed, but when the data comes into the cache. No, the, the data is compressed in memory, really. Okay, so, yeah. so the memory stores everything in the compressed form and then. That's right, and then it decompresses data when it comes here. Okay. And the hope then is that you can actually, when it comes to improving the memory bandwidth, that you actually, you know, you can look at that at the next slide, I think. Here is a, uh, the anatomy of this. Oh, I have uh, a question. Yeah. So, so uh, these days, um, uh, both the AMD and Intel, they offer uh, total memory encryption. Have you considered, in a in um, integrating both the compression and the encryption together in the MC. Uh, Absolutely, just yes, but be careful to do it in the right order, right? <laughs> because if you try to compress encrypted data, good luck. It's going to be nothing, right? Because yeah, uh, so it's the opposite. The encrypted data is totally. So what we actually have also is a product where we combine encryption with uh, compression, so then you have to first compress and then you encrypt, right? And, or, and then de decrypt uh, before you decompress, that was hard to get. So absolutely, yeah, we, are, we know about that, yes. Yeah, I mean, people think that the Absolutely. Absolutely, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. So um, that goes well with explaining this figure, and I'm going to uh, address that question. So, so let's look a little bit closer into this. Um, uh, uh, block here, the blocks here. So when the last level cache, when you miss in the last level cache, it will be intercepted by this uh, IP block. And then the first thing you do is to look into what we call a prefetch buffer. If you have that data, I'm going to get back to what, why that is important. If you don't have it, then you will have to uh, go to memory. Before you do that, you have to figure out where exactly is my memory block, because that's not at the same spot as if you don't compress the data, right? So we have an address translator here that will have metadata for on the page level for all the blocks in the page, exactly where, where that block is. And then you go to memory, and then um, you pick up that block. And if you're then lucky, uh, if all uh, neighboring blocks are compressed as well, then you will get them. Uh, as well when you do uh, 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 memory access. And then you will decompress all these uh, blocks that, that fill you know, block frame and insert them in this prefetch platform. Now let's suppose that we subsequently access the next block, I mean that you have high spatial locality, then you will find it in the prefetch platform and you will can't be able to cancel the, the memory request, right? And so you have saved bandwidth that way. That's, that's the way how it works. Now, of course, you can miss in this uh, structure too, and then you will have to pick up the metadata. But we have actually um, uh, a 
came up with an, uh, an, a smart te technique that would actually um, disable a compression when you have random, uh, very randomized accesses to memory, because then you will actually lose a lot of uh, performance or actually create a lot of traffic because of this address, uh, the metadata that is missing. So, so that one we have also taken care of in a quite effective way. Um, you were asking, yeah, so it's absolutely true. So there's also a write path here. Um, and so if, if you evict the block from, from uh, the last level cache, and it has to and it has to be written back to to memory. It has to be modified. Then you could actually end up with that uh, it takes larger space. So we have a quite elaborate scheme that actually can merge the uh, updated part with. In fact, uh, I don't have time to go too much into the detail, but we work on what is called a sector, a memory sector, which is actually you could. Think of it as a few consecutive mem memory blocks, okay? And so, uh, um, a block that is written back to memory, we have to merge with this sector, and we do that in an as efficient way as one can. So that's what basically this uh, uh, block does. Uh, I think I jumped over that one. It's not that. Don't have HPC. But they're wrong. Maybe that's okay. I was supposed to talk about this that not part of this presentation. I think I got the wrong presentation, but I don't know if we can deal with that. We'll take a while. Anyway, I, I think I more or less stopped there because in the interest of time I talked quite a bit, so maybe that's okay. So but I could summarize we, we had a, I don't need the slides. Um, we had a paper in uh, HPCA this year, which introduces what is called the GBDI. And actually, the background is that it can do much better in terms of compression than what I've shown here with Huffman. And GBDI is a good example. It carries the, in the acronym BDI, which was base delta immediate compression that I explained, right? Uh, with the first non-zero value being in the base, and then you do um, you compare all the values in, in the block with that and, and store the delta. So for, for values that are numerically similar with the base, we we'll get a lot of compression here. Now we notice that, um, and you can see that from the numbers. In fact, the compression rate for that is not that great, right? So. Um, um, we were asking ourselves if you had the luxury to pick your basis you know, in, let's say, you consider a page, right? What would be the end basis I would like to pick to maximize the compression ratio? Then, of course, you end up in, you know, doing clust clustering analysis, right? And our framework here is that you do Huffman coding offline in software, right? So. It's a, there is a data analysis phase. So we just thought that would fit nicely into that framework, right? So, um, so we noticed that if you do it that way, and we also actually did some contribution when it comes to clustering algorithms, because these uh, normal um, clustering algorithms don't get optimal results, then we could get the compression above factor of three. Uh, so that's what we have published in the open literature, but we have also done a lot of research in, in the company and come up with a lot of interesting ideas how you could combine, for example, deed application with statistical compression methods. Deed application takes essentially, you know, if you have two blocks that are the same, then you could, don't have to, you can kick out the, the, the redundant blocks, right? But you still sti have to keep the unit blocks um, in memory or in the cache, whatever where you want to benefit from it. Then you could apply statistical methods to this, right? With half one of this GBDI, and that will shrink as well, right? So combining these two, we have looked at, and then you get even more. So combinations of all these techniques tend to be extremely favorable. We are up to 
four x in compression ratio now, um, uh, and and we see still you know room for improvement. So that's pretty fun. Um, Ah, by the way, I will end with another anecdote I started with my daughter, right? And now I will end with a real interesting anecdote before I became a PhD student. So last year in engineering school, I, uh, someone knocked my door. It was, um, his name was Professor Hertz. Hertz is known for frequency app. It was actually his uh, grandfather's brother who was Irish Hertz. So he knocked my door, I, I want you to become my PhD student. And I had decided that I was a little bit introvert. You cannot think about that in the States. I was at that time, I was sitting with my small experiments and stuff like that. Uh, didn't, you know, just knock myself in. And then I said to myself, I need to go out and work, you know, at a company or something like that to get, get out of the, of the shell. And, um, so I turned that down, and I sometimes regretted it because that would have been probably very good supervisor, uh, good for my academic career. Anyway, that's you make decisions sometimes. They are good sometimes. Like that. So I started to work. My first work was actually to do um, compression on, but of uh, uh, doing voice recording, you know, voices and compress that. And at that point in time, computer memory was very expensive, so it made sense to make it very compact, uh, uh, store it very compactly. <clears throat> so I used what was called um, delta encoding, and it's very simple. So if the amplitude is increasing, and you store a one, so you sample it like this, right? If it's increasing, you store a one. If it's going down, you store a zero. So silence becomes one zero one zero one zero, right? And so I I started to I found oh, that fantastically interesting. So I recorded words, and then I could see that there was a lot of silence inside the world, and that we could do um, compact. Of course, what you say it's going to be silent for some so many samples, and so we just. I also noticed that buttons were extremely nice to contact the office. I did a lot of, you know, say research on, on that. And then um, that company I worked with, they closed down the whole division probably because I was not um, So I had to look for another job and then I looked for another industry. And after six months, I was totally small. I mean, it was more fun. So then I walked over the street to my own sort of university and saw so what kind of fine, fun, fun research project they, they had. And I ended up with my advisor uh, who did work on monthly processes. And it looks like I have not changed, I'm still in the monthly processes. But my first question to him, and that's against the anecdote, was I want to do research on compression. Said, wrong door, I'm not doing that, you have to find another way. <laughs> and this is like connecting the dots. Maybe it was that kind of, you know, thing early on in my career that put me back to, you know, I was uh, waiting for my model to sleep. Compression, that popped up, right? And the rest is easy. Thank you very much. Question. Ah, ah, yes, yes, yes. I'm going to move back. Let me see. Here, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, so for the value, you mean uh, why I say four bytes there, right? Yeah, so, so uh, what we did here in the experiment, so what would, in a value where cash, what would the 64 bytes, I think it was the fact that we couldn't make sense of what does a 64 byte plot mean in a value where cash because you're interested in the values right so four bytes means just that i mean we we store the value that is for the two bit values right are you keeping the 
Uh, so in in the first design which you, we throw out of the window, you could say, uh, well that would let me see how it works. Um, yeah, yeah that yeah that that must be the case, right? Because here in the value work app, what you would do is to index. Let me see how it works. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, that is that that must be the case, right? So you have actually one tag. So that creates a lot of overhead, that's for sure. Yeah. So that is one thing that we have a lot of but I have a different So what happens is uh, when you reduce you're basically reducing the you could think of it as two steps, right? In step one, you're reducing the cast block size from sixty four by sixty four bytes. In step two, then you're doing a compression on the Oh wait a second, so take the first step. No, that's not what you're so you would um, the thing is that for all the all the values in the let's say that all the values in the cache block are the same, then what that would mean is that for each of the sixty-four byte each of the value in the sixty-four byte block, you would have a point or to go after that particular value. Right? So for example, if all the values are the same, then your upman encoding would say that it just requires one bit to that's right, that, that you could do. Yeah. So now you just have one bit for every value. Uh -huh. But logically, I'm trying to break it into two bits because of this thing. So the point is the performance is going to be It could be for two reasons. Right? One is the obviously that the computer is compression. But the other thing is that by like, reducing this block size, you're basically saying that, that I'm assuming that the application doesn't have any space to it. It has temporal. So, for example, if I had an then having a 64 byte cache line would be a waste of time because all the that's right. Yes. That's right. Now, when you logically reduce this cache line size, you get a better, uh, you get an improvement in performance just because you're doing this. You manage it at a finer graph. Uh -huh. You're not wasting a lot of cache. So, that's one reason for which you would have a performance. The other reason would be because I mean, you are able to store more data because of the compression. That's right, yes. So these are the two reasons because which you would get this performance. So my question is like, did you also have any kind of comparison where you take a conventional cache, but the cache line size is four So So remember the model here is very simple. It's just, so, so what, I can tell you a little bit more how we did this experiment. So if you're, so, so uh, it's possible, plus with the conventional cache, to, to do to do this graph in one simulation using LRU stacks, right? So basically, the LRU stack, if you're not familiar with it, you you take uh, an ad the next address, right? And then you look at do I have this in my stack? If that is the case, then you increment the counter at that level, right? If you don't have it, then you push it on the top of the stack. Well, you also move this, uh, if you have it in the stack, then you move it to the top of the stack, right? So that's how LRU stack works. Now, we did exactly that experiment here as well, but with values, right? So we don't model, you know, any effect on performance. It's just, you know, in this single simulation across all the sizes, then you get the miss rate, essentially, uh, given a certain size of the cache. That's essentially what happens. Than let it be, uh, like, cash. So then you would know exactly how much of this performance. That's right, yes. If you, if you do a block of 64 bytes, uh, yes. Then like, maybe that would be something you That would be interesting to see, you're right. Yeah. So I you would like to have a, the corresponding number for four bytes, but with the convention of cash. Oh yeah, so, so, no, yeah. Well, uh, we have not do, done it, but other people have, have done it. Our papers on that. Uh, but what we had in the uh, HPCA uh, paper this year was actually an evaluation of the bandwidth uh, improvement. 
and that's for CPU and C, uh, for SPEC 2017 applications. And uh, we could show that uh, actually we, we improved the uh, performance by 10%. For, well, not for all uh, uh, SPEC 2017 benchmarks, but for those that are kind of memory intensive, right, where, where this technology then makes sense, then we actually improved uh, performance quite a bit. So that is all in that paper. But it makes more sense, you're absolutely right, it makes absolutely more sense for GPUs, and I think they have that uh, today. In GPUs, they have this kind of compression. Ah, when you do the value frequency analysis, question is if uh, you 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 have to deny. No, that's done on the fly in the background, right? So you don't have to, you know, uh, stop the, the cache from serving other requests. That's the, ah okay. So when you do with the encoding, that that is done in software. Sorry, I didn't hear. Processing occurs in the software. So you are asking about something deciding. What are you exactly? Resilient to approximation, then of course you can do much better. Absolutely. 
The problem I have with that is, uh, in general, I would say when you use approximation is that um, you have to have some guarantees, right? And so I used to talk about, well, approximation makes sense if it's controlled. That you know what, what, what would be the impact you know, on it. Uh, otherwise, I have a trouble with the approximation. Oh, you can just ask. They won't be able to hear me. They will be able to hear me. Just ask. Them. Are there any questions uh, from the audience uh, that are uh, from uh, virtually? No. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah, this one, but yeah. No, he said no. Okay. okay I'll do. All right, then, so there are no further questions that are for the next one. Thank you very much. On behalf of the department, I would like to put a small Oh, thanks.